Well, good morning, everyone. It's great to be with you this morning, and thanks for joining us for our online service on this Palm Sunday. Now, normally Palm Sunday is a crazy event at the Greenway Centre. We normally have loads of kids in, loads of families. We're all together. There's conga lines, there's jumping up and down, there's all kinds of noise. And Tim Dobson usually takes it as an opportunity to try and show us in a complicated craft project. Now, he claims you can turn a rolled up newspaper into a palm branch. Um, I've never been able to get it to work. That might just be because I'm useless at crafts. But the reality is, if you're you're interested in seeing how you can do it you can actually time travel through the miracles of the modern internet you can go back an entire year would you believe yes it's been that long to a video uh, one of our Sunday morning services on Palm Sunday last year Tim Dobson and Bev explained how to turn a rolled up newspaper into a palm branch hold of the one of the middle ones and gently pull and you should find that you have a palm leaf ready to shake and to wave during our worship this morning. So you can go back, watch that video, create your own palm branch, and then bounce around your house shouting Hosanna. That's if you want to. Um, today we kick off our, it's Palm Sunday as I say, and that kicks off Holy Week or Easter Week. And Joe's going to be sharing with us about Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane and um, a little bit about Good Friday and how that shows us what God's love is like, um, how Jesus came to be a, to serve others rather than to be served. So that's coming up. And there's a number of other Easter Week events coming up. Um, they're in my email, so do read that. And the only other thing to say really is, if you've not been to one of our services at Greenway, I'd really encourage you to come along. I know it's been a long long lockdown and many of us feel slightly out of touch with church but if you've been watching the videos and you feel safe to do so do come along to Greenway we'd love you to join us for our Easter Sunday service it, Marion and the team have done a brilliant job of making everybody feel very safe there's lots of distance between the chairs um, and lots of fresh air as well um, so do come and join us for that if you're able otherwise tune in online for what will be a really great Easter Sunday service so I'm just going to pray for us now as we kick off yeah, Father God, I just pray now that like the first inhabitants of Jerusalem, you would help us to welcome you, that we would be willing to say welcome, Lord, into our lives, into our homes, into this time and space now, Lord. I just pray that you'd help each one of us to open up to you, to be willing to receive something of your love and grace this morning. Would you come, Lord Jesus, we pray. Amen.
God wants to sing over us this morning. Will you let me be your strength? Will you let me be your shield? Will you let me be your strength? Will you let me be your strength? Be your shield, be your strength. Matthew 26, verse 17. On the first day of the festival of unleavened bread, the disciples came to Jesus and asked him, Where do you want us to get the Passover meal ready for you? Go to a certain man in the city, he said, and tell him. The teacher says, My hour has come. My disciples and I will celebrate Passover at your house. The disciples did as Jesus had told them and prepared the Passover meal. When it was evening, Jesus and the twelve disciples sat down to eat. During the meal, Jesus said, I tell you, one of you will betray me. The disciples were very upset and began to ask him, one after another, Surely, Lord, you don't mean me. Jesus asked, The one who dips his bread in the dish with me will betray me. The Son of Man will die, as the scriptures say he will. How, but how terrible for that man who betrays the Son of Man. It would have been better for that man if he had not been born. Judas, the traitor, spoke up. Surely, teacher, you don't mean me. Jesus asked, Jesus answered, So you say. While they were eating, Jesus took a piece of bread, gave a prayer of thanks, and broke it, and gave it to his disciples. Take it and eat it, he said. This is my body. Then he took a cup, gave thanks to God, and gave it to them. Drink it, all of you, he said. This is my blood, which heals God's covenant, my blood poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. I tell you, never again drink the Drink this wine until the day I drink the new wine with you in my father's kingdom. They sang a hymn and went out to the Mount of Olives. Then Jesus went with his disciples to a place called Gethsemane and he said to them, Sit here while I go over there and pray. He took Peter and the two sons of Zebedee. Grief and anguish came over him and he said to them, The sorrow in my heart is so great it almost crushes me. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went a little farther on, threw himself face down on the ground and prayed, My father, if it is possible, take this cup of suffering from me. Yet, not what I want, but what you want. Then he returned to the three disciples and found them asleep, and he said to Peter, How is it that you three were not able to keep watch with me for even an hour? Keep watch and pray you will not fall into temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Once more, Jesus went away and prayed, My father, if this cup of suffering cannot be taken away from me unless I drink it, your will will be done. He returned once more and found the disciples asleep. They could not keep their eyes open. Again, Jesus left them, went away and prayed the third time, saying the same words. 
And then he returned to the disciples. Are you still sleepy and resting? Look, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be handed over to the power of sinners. Get up and let us go. Look, here is the man who is betraying me. Today we're looking at the life of Jesus and we're looking at servanthood and what it means to be a servant like Jesus was. I don't know if you have any friends who seem very perfect. They have a perfect house, they have a perfect kids, they have a perfect dog probably, and you know, they have a perfect garden and um, you know, they seem to produce meals effortlessly. If there's a cake sale at school, they bring in this wonderful creation. They never forget, you know, things like Red Nose Day or uh, children in need and their children are always immaculately dressed. Well, I've learned a secret. If you ever think that other people are the perfect family, invite them on a camping weekend. Now, my family and I, we love to go camping and we do quite a few weekend camping trips with friends um, over the course of a year. And um, what I love about camping is if you get there early, then you can be that perfect family. You've got your tent set up, you've got your meal on, your kids are playing happily and you see these other families arrive. They generally arrive quite tight-lipped, one of them, the other one rolling their eyes. Now, that's either because of two reasons. They can't get everything in the car. Now, that always starts an argument. Tim will say to me, why are you bringing this? And I'm like, because it's essential. But, you know, camping stuff, a car and kids, you can never get it in the car. You're going to have to compromise. Now, the other reason you might have an argument on the way there is because generally on the way to a camping site you get lost and the person who is driving insists they are going the right way and doesn't want to turn around so by the time you've done the 15 mile detour everyone's a little bit hot a little bit tired a little bit grumpy and a little bit hungry when they get there and then you have this perfect family who's already had one argument in the car having to put up a tent And if you've ever watched someone else put up a tent, it is a joy. Now, you have to cooperate to put up a tent. You can put up a tent with one person, but to be honest, it's pretty hard work. And so you need a level of cooperation. You need a level of somebody being in charge and making decisions. And who is that person who's going to be in charge? And um, yes, that's one way to really see what people are like is to go camping with them. And when we look at Jesus in this passage and we look at servanthood, we look at somebody who the disciples have spent time with. They know that this guy does what he talks about. So you've got the crowd and they're going into Jerusalem. It's Palm Sunday. They're waving branches and they're saying, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And they're expecting this amazing thing to happen. They're expecting maybe a revolution to happen. But actually... You know, Jesus then kind of goes away and he um, has the Last Supper and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane and takes time to pray and to be with God. And it doesn't particularly look like he's about to start a revolution. Um, And it's interesting for the disciples, because what were they thinking at this point? They had been living with this guy for three years, kind of day in, day out. They probably knew everything there was to know about Jesus. And he had demonstrated his love for people. He'd talked to children, he'd talked to tax collectors, he'd talked to prostitutes, he'd stopped in the middle of really important engagements to talk to somebody at the side of the road who was a little bit random, a little bit odd, and to be honest, kind of a bit shunned by society and shouldn't have been there in the first place. But God, Jesus, had time for people. And when we see Jesus, we see a God who isn't playing up to a crowd, a God who loves And because he loves, he serves. And in these last few days, and um, Kezi is going to read the passage for you now, we see Jesus taking this servanthood to extreme. He takes his servanthood to death. And his whole life is built on servanthood and it's built on surrender. And so over the next 10 minutes or so, there's four words which we're going to look at um, in terms of servanthood and how we can follow his example. The servant king. So we start with Passover. Every year the Israelites would remember when they had left Egypt, when the angel of death had passed over their houses. They had smeared blood on the lintels and on the door frames and the angel of death had passed over them. And so they would get together and they would take a lamb and they would take bread and they would eat it and they remember how the Lord had rescued him, rescued them. So this is what Jesus was doing with his disciples. Jesus was sitting down in a room and he took bread and he tore it and he said, this is my body, which is broken for you. And then he took a cup and he said, this is my blood, which I am pouring out for you. 
And he said, do this and remember me. So as we look at this passage, we see Jesus who in Palm Sunday, people were expecting these huge things from this kind of king, this rescuer, this saviour. And instead, we see somebody who is choosing a really different path. We see somebody who is choosing a path of death, a path of sacrifice and a path of surrender. And I don't know if you're like me. I don't know if you've ever wondered why Jesus couldn't do it differently. Why did Jesus have to die? Wasn't there a different plan which God could do? But what we need to remember is that Jesus was God. And so actually, God himself came down to earth so that we could be friends with God, so that that relationship could be repaired, and that God himself was dying on a cross. God came to die with us so that we could live with him, so that that relationship could be restored. This was a God who showed us what it was like to serve. This was a God who had time for people. It was a God who chose the hard path and who didn't use his powers to cut corners. He didn't go into the desert and secretly, you know, turn the loaves into bread or command a flock of angels to rescue him. But actually, this was a God whose path, who knew what his path was, and he chose to keep walking. Now, every year I have a word for the year. I've given up on New Year's resolutions. They're quite tricky to keep and my uh, kind of motivation generally runs out on about day three. But a word is more of an intention. And this year, my, my word is walk. And there's a few reasons for that. So one, I'm trying to walk a thousand miles this year. I've signed up for the challenge. Um, It means I have to do about three miles a day um, every day, which, you know, doesn't feel too bad. But if you miss a few days, kind of catches up with you. Um, But there's another reason for that as well is um, I found I found, you know, the last kind of 12 months quite difficult. And I really felt like God challenged me to say, just keep walking with me. You might not be running. You might not be sprinting. You know, this might not be the best time in your life for your faith, but keep walking, keep moving forward. Um, And, you know, with my hand in God's, that's what I can do. And I believe that's what God tells us to do, to keep walking. So when Jesus became a servant, he calls us to also become a servant. He invites us to be part of that family of God and to join with him in that mission and to follow his example, to pour out our lives in sacrificial giving, to keep walking just one step at a time. Now, my mum used to look after my kids one day a week and occasionally I would come home and um, I would find that she would clean the fridge. And I don't know if you um, have ever had anyone clean your fridge, but you do notice, you, you know, you open the fridge and you open the door and it's clean and it's organised. And all those horrible bowls of things you should have thrown away and you haven't thrown away have been thrown away. And if someone cleans your fridge, you can really tell that someone's cleaned your fridge. And my mum didn't have to do that. You know, she was looking after my kids, um, you know, which was great in itself. But as an act of love, um, as an act of service, um, you know, occasionally she would clear clear my fridge. And, you know, she's passed away now. And that's something which I remember whenever I clean my fridge. I I remember my mum who cleaned it. Um, And, you know, that's that's what Jesus is like. He is um, in this passage. He's a servant who's acting out of love. He's not acting because it's the right thing to do, because other people are doing it, because, you know, he'll be the only one who doesn't do it and really he should get involved. But actually this servanthood comes out of love. And the whole story of Jesus from the prophecies in Isaiah to the story of Mary is a story where people are prepared to be servants. So Mary says to the angel Gabriel, I am the Lord's servant. Let it be to me according to as you have said. And it's a really scary challenge in terms of thinking, are we prepared to be a servant? Are we prepared to give up our time and our money? And are we prepared to surrender? And that's the second word which we're going to look at, surrender. We can't serve without surrender. And surrender means surrendering our own will, our own desires, our own priorities. And going back to the Garden of Gethsemane, we can see there were times when Jesus had to surrender his own will. It looks like there was times when Jesus actually wanted to give up. In Matthew 26, verse 39, Jesus prays, My Father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not what I want, but what you want. He then returned to his disciples and he found them sleeping. Could you men not keep watch with me for one hour? He asked Peter. 
Watch and pray that you do not fall into temptation, for the spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. He went away for a second time and said, My father, if it is possible, may this cup be taken away, unless I drink it, but may your will be done. And then he came back and he found them sleeping again because their eyes were heavy. And then he went away and prayed a third time, saying the same thing. So as Christians, we're called to imitate the life of Christ and follow Jesus' example of servanthood. And we need to surrender. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus surrendered. He knew what was coming and he chose to go through with it. And we know that God loves us and we know that God is for us, that God is good. But he also calls us to surrender. Now, I've been doing this Bible app this year, which Claire Hamilton recommended, actually, called Lecto 365. Um, It's an app. It's really easy. It doesn't take particularly long, you know. Um, But what I really like about it is I really like the kind of thoughtfulness and the creativity which has gone into it. Um, And this week it's had a number of prayers, um, which I have found quite tricky to pray myself. Um, And they are about surrender. So I'm going to read you one here. Um, So this is called A Prayer of Disruption by M.K.W. Heitcher. And it says, Disturb me, Lord, when I am too well pleased with myself, when my dreams have become true because I have dreamed too little, when I arrive safely because I sailed too close to the shore. Disturb me, Lord, when the abundance of things I possess means I have lost my thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, I have ceased to dream of eternity. And in my efforts to build a new earth, I have allowed my vision of a new heaven to dim. Disturb me, Lord, to dare more boldly, to venture on the wider seas where the storms will show your mastery, where losing sight of land I shall find stars. I ask you to to push back the horizons of my hopes and to push into a future in strength, courage, hope and love. It really challenged me because surrender isn't easy and actually... You know, I struggle, you know, um, I've got a child at home self-isolating this week. Um, But actually, my life isn't terribly difficult. You know, if you look at the life of Jesus, you look at life of the early disciples and, you know, people who are being persecuted around the world. And, you know, what does surrender to Jesus really mean? Um, And what am I prepared to do differently if I pray that prayer? Um, But actually, surrender comes from relationship. It comes from knowing that we have a God who loves us, a God who we can trust. And that's the next word, relationship. Relationship. Jesus surrendered to God's will because he trusted God. He knew who God was. He knew that he was a father who loved him, who was for him. He'd spent time with God, you know, not an emergency prayer when he needed a parking space or where something bad happened, but he regularly retreated from people. He went up to the mountains and he spent time with God and it restored his soul. He knew who this God was and therefore he could surrender because he knew that God was good. Proverbs 3 verse 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, submit to him and he will make your path straight. So when we pray, do we surrender? Do we trust God with the outcome, regardless of what the outcome is? Do we trust a God because we know that he is for us? We know that he is listening. Or do we think that actually we can probably do a better job by ourselves? To serve like Jesus served, to serve out of love, to serve out of fully surrender, then we need to trust God and that God is good. God's not a slot machine where we do a great single parents fair and we have X amount of effort and beautiful ice cakes and we end up with three fully baptised kind of paid up members of the congregation. But actually in each, each act of servanthood, we need to surrender and we need to surrender in that relationship with God. So do you ever wonder what God has called you to do? I've thought that many times and um, I started off as a journalist quite a few years ago now. And um, I really felt in being a journalist that God called me to be a voice for the voiceless. And um, I've now kind of moved and I now work in diversity and inclusion. But I kind of feel like that still stands. It's about standing up for the under God dog. It's about making sure people's voices are heard and represented to make sure people are included and invited to the party and um, asked to dance when they get there. And that's what I think 
God has called me to do. Um, and so when I talk about serving, you know, yes, there's great things to get involved with at church. And, you know, yes, let's get involved in our communities and, you know, let's get involved in our workplaces. But let's not narrow it down into kind of one small thing. But actually in our everyday lives, as you know, it says in the message, you know, in every single act of kind of getting up and going out and in the places we go and the people who we see, how do we serve God in those situations? So what does God call us to do? In Micah 6, 8, it says, the Lord, what does the Lord require of you but to do justice, to love kindness and to walk humbly with your God? And when Jesus was asked, he said, love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your strength and all your mind and love your neighbour as yourself. So my final thought as we move on from relationship is actually relationship is a two way thing. So we love God and we worship God with our servanthood, but he gives us all the resources which we need to do it. We're not doing it in our own strength, but he gives us more than that. He gives us freedom. And so my next word is freedom. Freedom. So in that servanthood surrender relationship triangle, we have this amazing gift of freedom. And Romans 8 says it best, where it says, can anything separate us from God's love? Does it mean he no longer loves us if we have trouble or in calamity or are persecuted or hungry or destitute or in danger or threatened with death? As the scriptures say, for your sake, we are killed every day. We are being slaughtered like sheep. But despite all these things, overwhelming victory is ours through Christ who loved us. And I'm convinced that nothing can separate us from God's love. Neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor demons. Neither fears for today or worries for tomorrow. Nor the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or earth below, or indeed nothing in all of creation will be able to separate us from the love of God, which is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. So when we trust God, we find this freedom for Jesus in choosing to fully surrender to God and to die on the cross. It means that we have this freedom that we're celebrating in Easter next week. It means that we can have a relationship with God. So my challenge for myself and for you is what do we need to surrender what do we need to lay down so that we can have that fullness of life life in all its fullness i'm going to end with this prayer of surrender which i read part way through and if you can please join with me in praying it disturb me lord when i am too well pleased with myself when my dreams have become true because i have dreamed too little when I arrived safely because I sailed too close to the shore. Disturb me, Lord, when the abundance of things I possess means I have lost my thirst for the waters of life. Having fallen in love with life, I have ceased to dream of eternity. And in my efforts to build a new earth, I have allowed my vision of a new heaven to dim. Disturb me, Lord, to dare more boldly to venture on wider seas where the storms show your mastery, where in losing sight of land I shall find the stars. I ask you to push back the horizons of my hopes and to push into the future in strength, courage, hope and love. Amen. Wonderful, so wonderful is your
Well, that's all we've got time for this morning. I hope you've enjoyed being with us. I'm just going to pray for us now as we close. Yeah, Father God, I thank you for your great love for us. I thank you that your son came not to be served, but to serve, to demonstrate your love, to demonstrate what love looks like in our world. And I just pray now, Lord, that you would help us this week to follow his example, the example of the servant king, that we would be willing to put others' interests first, that we would be willing to love our neighbour as ourselves, that we might be salt and light in all the situations and places we find ourselves in, that we might, through our lives, through our words, through our actions, demonstrate something of your love. In Jesus' precious name. Amen. Amen. There's no Zoom after the service, but I hope you have a fantastic week. And we'll see you again, same time, same place, next week, either online or at the Greenway Centre for Easter Sunday. Bye.